So, I've had the M2 iPad Pro for about two weeks now, and in this video, I wanna give you guys my two week review and let you guys know why this is Apple's best iPad to date. And I'm gonna review this in its own silo because obviously, if you're an M1 iPad Pro owner, the M2 upgrade is not gonna be worth it for you. These devices are getting so good, and not just on the iPad side, you know, on the iPhone side, on the MacBook side, that getting a year over year or maybe an every 18 month upgrade just isn't going to be worth it anymore. These devices are meant to be used into four to five year increments. So that's why I wanted to review the M2 iPad Pro in its own silo because there are still people out there that are getting their first ever iPad Pro and this M2 iPad Pro is going to be amazing for them in its own right. So without further ado, let's talk about the M2 iPad Pro two weeks later and why this tablet is absolutely amazing. Let's get into it. So I thought the best way to review this M2 iPad Pro over these last two weeks is to talk about different use cases that I use this iPad Pro for personally and let you guys know how the experience is and if it can get me from point A to point B with that task. Because I can sit here and let you guys know what the tech specs are, how fast it can be, the Geekbench scores, you know, how fast the Wi-Fi is, but at the end of the day, those are just pure raw numbers and they don't really paint the right picture of whether or not this is going to be your workhorse computer moving forward. But before we get into those use cases, I do want to briefly touch on what's new with the M2 iPad Pro versus the M1 iPad Pro. So there's only three main things to worry about when you're talking about the M2 version versus the M1 version. And just to let you guys know, we are talking mostly about the 12.9 inch one. So we're going to be talking about that mini LED display. But the three main things are new Wi-Fi 6E enablement. So if you have a Wi-Fi 6E router, you'll be getting very, very quick Wi-Fi speeds, both upload and download. And even if you don't have a Wi-Fi 6E enabled router, it'll still boost your Wi-Fi speeds to a certain extent. So you can see that my Wi-Fi speeds, when I compared it from the M1 to the M2, even though I don't have a Wi-Fi 6E router, it is still faster on the M2 iPad Pro than the M1 iPad Pro. The second thing that was added was new 5G bands. So that's something I personally could not test out because I don't use a data enabled iPad for any of my iPads. But basically what that means is that you can do low band, high band, and even high frequency ones, depending on which 5G tower you're next to. So if you are close to one of those super fast 5G towers, you will get you know one to two gigs of download speeds, even though those situations are very rare, especially here in the US. And then lastly, the only real tangible feature that was added was this new hover feature with the Apple Pencil 2, which from my use case, I've only seen one real good use case, and that's inside of Affinity Photo, where it gives you a nice little preview of what you're about to erase or what you're about to draw. So if you guys are into the hover feature, it is a welcome addition, but so far, I need to see a little bit more of actual tangible use cases for me to really be like, wow, this hover thing isn't really a gimmick and it's more of a functional use case and functional feature that is more of an added value versus kind of just a little gimmick on the side, something that they could do versus something that they needed to do. So those are the three main things that were different from the M2 iPad Pro and the M1. And then also the colorway is a little bit different. Like you can see that the space grays are actually different colors of space grays. So that's another thing to take note of. And on the rear of the iPad, on the M2 iPad Pro, it now says iPad Pro instead of just iPad. So little things there that I did notice while using the iPad. But now let's talk about those use cases that I was mentioning. So the first one we're gonna talk about is overall productivity work. Can this iPad Pro handle everything you throw at it from a productivity standpoint? And from productivity standpoint, I mean running your mail client of choice, whether that is a native mail app or something like Spike Nail or Gmail. Can it run it at the best of its ability? Absolutely it can. Can it use things like the iWork suite or the Microsoft suite? So using the iWork suite, which is a first party kind of system and productivity suite versus a third party productivity suite. And I can let you guys know that both of them work extremely well to an extent. I know a lot of people are pro master Excel users. So if you're somebody that is really crazy into Excel, then this is probably not the perfect situation for you. If you are a basic Excel user, a basic numbers user, a basic sheets user, then you're gonna be totally fine. So being able to add variables, being able to use your different shortcuts inside of Excel, being able to have multiple sheets that talk to each other inside of Excel, all that works great. And even things like pivot tables still work on Microsoft Excel on the iPad Pro. You just can't start them from scratch. You can use already an existing pivot table and bring it over to the iPad Pro. So those are little things and little nuances that I've been able to kind of see and find out over the years of using an iPad Pro as my main computer. But some other productivity tasks are being able to use web-based applications. And web-based applications work extremely well because Safari even though it's kind of still a mobile browser inside of the iPad, you do get desktop class you know, browsing experiences. So if you're using things like Osana or Monday.com or even the Microsoft Suite online or things like the G Suite online, being able to use Gmail online as well, all that stuff still works as if you're using it on a laptop for the most part, especially if you're using the Magic Keyboard with the trackpad and using that cursor support is absolutely great. 
And then I know there's a big community of coders in there that want to use their iPad. And I do a little bit of coding, especially in applications like Termius and things like that. And for the most part, it works extremely well if you are able to use an application that works well with the iPad. And I, and I can't say that it's going to work exactly with your software. I can't say that it's going to work exactly how you use your coding software, but make sure that it does work. And when it does work, then it, it will work extremely well. So for my little, you know, skill of being able to code and being able to get into applications and even, you know, Swift Playgrounds is something that's kind of building on itself year over year to make it easier to code on the iPad. All that stuff is doable on the iPad. Just make sure that it works for you before diving into the iPad full time. So from a productivity standpoint, I give it an absolute pass. The iPad can handle anything that you throw at it, whether it's a simple iMessage or a simple email to doing more, you know, 30, 40, 50 page PowerPoint presentations with animations and moving stuff around and being able to use the iWork suite pretty seamlessly. And now even with things like Freeform, which I have a video, if you guys do want to check that out in the description below, highly recommend checking out Freeform and it does come out with the 16.2 release, but things like Freeform to be even more collaborative and productive, this machine will handle everything. And that's what the M2 is there for, to give you that extra C CPU performance and GPU performance on top of that. And now let's move over to the creative side because I know there's a lot of different camps on how people use the iPad. People use the iPad for business stuff like lead generation, emails, working inside of the Microsoft suite, using Microsoft Outlook, right? But then there's another camp where it's artists, it's creatives, it's people that need it for videography and for video editing, for affinity photo and photo editing and things of that nature. And for my use case, which I, again, I run the channel all on the iPad, I edit everything on the iPad for both the thumbnail and video, and the iPad has been doing that for years and years and years. I use an application called LumaFusion to edit my video, which is more than enough. I kind of see it as a more advanced than something like iMovie, but a little less advanced than something like Final Cut Pro or Premiere Pro. But you can still have, you know, six different layers of video, six different layers of audio. You can use stabilization. You can stabilize it inside of the actual application itself. You can add different LUTs. You can slow-mo, you can fast forward, you can add voiceovers. You can do anything that you want to inside of LumaFusion and the iPad Pro has never ever faltered. File management on the iPad Pro is a little weird, especially with applications like LumaFusion, which constantly adds redundant files. You gotta go in, in there and kind of organize your files every now and then. But outside of that little kind of caveat, which is something that I personally deal with, it will be able to export these videos in 4K30, in 4K60, whatever you throw at it, it'll be able to handle even 8K footage, which is something that I don't use whatsoever because I don't own an 8K display or 8K camera, but it will be able to handle 8K if you throw it at it. And then same thing goes on the photo editing side, right? I use something called Affinity Photo for my thumbnails, and then I use just a regular Photos app to do some final touches in terms of adding filters and adding LUTs and adding some extra graphics. So the combination of the Photos application and Affinity Photo have been wonderful for me. But I know other people use things like Procreate, they use things like Lightroom, they use, there is a certain version of Adobe Photoshop that can be used on the iPad Pro, and people seem to love it and creatives seem to really, really enjoy it, especially with the Apple Pencil 2. And since we are talking about the creative side of the iPad Pro, I do wanna bring up that mini LED display. The mini LED display alone, in my opinion, is worth the price tag of this iPad Pro, let alone everything else that it can do. Because the mini LED display is so crisp and so clear and so bright and so pretty to look at that it's 100% worth it. The only other thing that you can get at a, at a low price point, low for lack of a better term, is that $5,000 Apple Pro Display XDR, like they are on par with each other. The pixels are very bright when they need to be, the blacks are extremely dark when they need to be, even though it's not an OLED, it's still just a mini LED display. Yes, there was that blooming gate situation that happened when it first came out on the M1 iPad Pro, but I have not heard a single complaint ever since that because the only time it does happen, the blooming, is when you're in a pitch black room and you turn the brightness all the way to 100%, which is a situation that nobody ever does because the dimmer the room is, the dimmer the brightness needs to be. But that is the creative aspects and use cases of the M2 iPad Pro alongside of that display tech because the mini LED, again, is 100% worth it and it's the cheapest entry point to get such a high level display. Even if you use it as a secondary display for your MacBook Pro, it's still worth it. And then also, since we are talking about the creative side, moving big files is a big deal with the iPad Pro. So having a Thunderbolt 4 port built into the iPad Pro is an absolute game changer. Being able to transfer things at 10 gigabytes per second with, with ease, with no problem, is something that gets taken for granted, especially with the iPads. Because once you go to the iPad Air, iPad Mini, and now the new iPad 10, those are just USB-C ports and they are way slower than a Thunderbolt 4 port. So keep that in mind. And now the next category I wanna talk about is leisure. Now with the 12.9 inch iPad Pro, it is a big iPad, it is a big tablet. So if you're gonna be on the couch with the iPad kinda of sitting on top of your face, you like holding it up, your arms are gonna get kinda of tired unless you're absolutely yoked and that's all you do when you go to the gym, right? So using your iPad as a leisure device definitely does work and definitely can handle anything that you throw at it from HDR video, 
4K content, Netflix streaming, YouTube streaming, pick your application of choice and it'll be able to run it and run it alongside other applications as well. So the iPad Pro can handle anything you can throw at it from a leisure standpoint. It's just a matter of, it is a larger device, so if you're gonna throw it around, use it on the couch, it probably won't be the best size. I would probably aim for the 11 inch iPad Pro if you're gonna just use it as a throw around tablet. But it's always nice to know that you can literally have a great movie experience with the iPad Pro, especially with those four speakers. Those four speakers are so loud, so robust, the bass is punchy. Like it's a great Bluetooth speaker. Like if you went to a party and this is the only speaker you had and you put it on a table, it's gonna be good enough and it's gonna be loud enough to at least fill in a room, which is great with those speakers. And then another part of leisure activity is gaming. So gaming has become more and more a proponent of the iPad Pro for me as the years go on, especially with things like Apple Arcade, things like being able to connect your Xbox and PlayStation controllers and now your Switch Joy-Cons where you can connect natively via Bluetooth and use them normally. Like I play a lot of NBA 2K on the iPad Pro. So for me, my iPad Pro is my gaming console of choice. So like build that into the price point of the iPad. A four, five, six hundred dollar gaming console is inside of the iPad Pro. And that's whether you're gaming directly on the iPad, on the iPad's hard drive, or if you're cloud gaming with things like NVIDIA or, you know, RIP Stadia, but that's still something that was around. You know, things like the Xbox Cloud, that still works perfectly. So having the iPad in the ProMotion display and 120 hertz refresh rate on the iPad while gaming, it's a sleeper. I mean, I probably wouldn't do any esports gaming with it, but if you're somebody like me who just casually games, likes to do a be a player on 2K, likes to have a season in 2K, likes to play a little bit of Marvel Strike Force, you know, smaller things, just to pass maybe a half an hour or one hour time frame over the weekend, this thing is more than enough and you do not need to buy yourself a PlayStation 5 or an Xbox One or whatever else is out there because I'm so disconnected from the gaming world because the iPad can do more than enough for me personally. But that is pretty much gonna do it for this video, everybody. Like you saw, the iPad can handle everything you throw at it. Sure, it's not Mac OS. Sure, the operating system is a little bit more of a toy-like if you wanna describe it that way. But things like Stage Manager, things like desktop level applications, things like Freeform and Collaboration are bringing the iPad closer and closer to Mac OS than, vice, than Mac OS being closer and closer to the iPad. So for me personally, the iPad is a computer. It can, can be my main computer, it is my main computer, it's my main editor of choice, it's what I do to run this YouTube channel, it's what I do to do some administrative tasks. So the iPad Pro is the reason why I am on YouTube for lack of a better reason, right? But I do also see the other side of the argument that it's just an overpowered iPhone or an overpowered tablet with the software holding it back. So just make sure the applications that you need are there before buying an iPad Pro. And if they are there, then you're gonna be extremely happy to use the iPad Pro as your main computer. It's the most versatile product that Apple makes. It's the most fun product that Apple makes to use. Like being able to do tasks that you would do on the iPad Pro versus doing it on a MacBook Air, it's just more fun to do it on the iPad Pro and it's less distracting because the multitasking isn't as robust as Mac OS or as mature as Mac OS. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to review this iPad in its own silo. Forget about the M1 iPad Pro, the M2 iPad Pro. This is the only version of the iPad Pro that Apple sells brand new. Yes, you can go to the refurbished and save a few bucks with an older one, which I also do recommend. Those are powerful enough but the M2 iPad Pro is Apple's latest and greatest. And if you're getting your first iPad, you're gonna love this one. If you're coming from an older iPad that isn't the M1, you're gonna love this one because with the M2 chip, you also get extended monitor support, you get stage manager, and you get all these new cool features that Apple's bringing like, ref like reference mode and being able to make things smaller in display zoom. The iPad Pro has a great life ahead of it, in my opinion, and this will be your iPad and your main computer for the next four to five years. But that's gonna do it everybody. Leave some comments down below about what you thought about my use cases, what you thought about this review, what you think overall the M2 iPad Pro, because I think it's worth it, even though a lot of people think it's not worth the upgrade. Remember, these devices are getting so good that year over year upgrades aren't for the person that's upgrading every year. If you're upgrading every year, it's just because you want to, not because you need to. And I'm gonna leave everybody with that. If you guys do wanna watch some more iPad OS, Mac OS, or iOS videos, click on one of these right here. Definitely stay subscribed because we will be doing a lot of new accessory videos for the month of November, and we are trying to get to 800,000 subs before the end of the year. But I'm Fernando, and until next time, 